Okay, welcome everyone. So we are now, this is a week five, I believe it is. So we're at the halfway point uh, for the EMDA classes, all the SU classes. Um, today, I think is hopefully um, there, you know, might be as always, there might be some things that feel a little frustrating or don't work or are, are sort of new language or new tools and things like that that we'll be dealing with. Um, but that aside, there's some really, really fun stuff that's going to be coming up today also. There's the really exciting um, sort of joy of getting something to move um, uh, stuff that's going to be happening today. So we did a, a little tiny demo with one of, I think, with for one of my um, sections related to that because uh, a couple of people were really excited, but it's, it, it's fun. Once you start seeing that hero move around, characters move around, and really we're going to be able to be doing that, get characters to move today, as well as getting them to um, move with control from keyboard input, which is even more exciting. Um, and uh, maybe a few other minor things along the way, as well as the step of getting things to live up on the web. So right now we've um, been working um, running things locally, as we call it. So having files stored on, on your computer and your, even though you're using um, Chrome um, this last week to look at things, which you think of as a web browser, you can use Chrome as we have been doing to look at files that are stored locally on your computer. Um, so, um, you know, you make those changes, you save them on your computer, you can see them all that in Chrome, but there's no one else in, in the world can get access to that unless they have access to your computer. Um, so this step that we're actually going to start with today is showing you how to make that connection from things being stored locally to things being stored remotely. Um, and what that means is that um, for any time that there's a, a, like a website that you access, it means that somewhere out there, there is a hard drive um, or a computer that is set up as a server, meaning that it is able to take requests and when people send a little message saying, give me the content at a particular address, it sends all the data um, back to the, uh, um, to the person making that call. And all that sort of stuff happens um, sort of behind the scenes in a way when you type in a URL. Um, you know, that's a, uh, that is a, a web address and it's going to go find the files at that location and that hard drive is going to serve those files back to you. Um, so what that allows, obviously, is that people from many different places or almost anywhere can access the same files. Um, so it's a great way of sharing, great way of making things public. Um, and also it's a really important step um, in, in testing and debugging a process and debugging a project. Um, because there may be issues that, um, that change when you go from working locally to working more remotely in this way. And sometimes, um, uh, there, there'll be some issues that get a little frustrating because you think, well, what? it just it worked when I was working locally, but it's not working here or vice versa. And we'll sort of um, help walk through some of those issues. Um, and a lot of those issues come about without going too much too deep into them right now, but have come, or come up in relationship to security issues. Um, as you can imagine, security is kind of an important aspect when working with online things. So you don't want a website to be able to, for example, get access to your local files, the files on your computer, unless you explicitly grant access to it. Because otherwise you could just go to a website um, and just by typing in that website, it would then worm its way into your computer and, and could extract whatever it wanted. So there's a lot of sort of layers of protection um, that happen as a result of that. And sometimes it comes back in sort of frustrating or seemingly frustrating ways where um, you to be able to get uh, to display images in ways or in, from different sources, you'll get sorts of errors that come up with that. Um, so one thing that we'll see later on are these um, uh, cross-domain uh, errors uh, where you're trying to load a file locally, but it's being displayed remotely and they get, um, get issues like that. And we'll give you some tips on that. But hopefully none of that stuff will actually really come up today. But the getting the files hosted locally or hosted remotely is going to be happening today. So let's start with that. Um, and there's uh, first to do this. First, I want to show you um, uh, just a couple of resources on the Moodle page that have been added um, over the last couple of days. Um, so let's see. I guess I'll do it like that. And we'll come here. Okay. So um, in our um, Moodle page, 
uh, sorry, I'll scroll back up just so you know where we're sort of hit, uh, coming to it from here. Um, we go in through this opening stuff. We're past our introduction to coding week three stuff, and we are in game development project weeks four to 10, and look under week five. So there's two things, um, and these could have been conflated to one, but you might from week in weeks um, forward from now, you're gonna wanna come back if you need to, to remember how to get your files up on the web. Um, so this resource is here, and then the stuff that we're going to be working through today primarily is going to be in this project one, two. Um, so control movement with keyboard input and conditionals. So, but first of all, this one, how to get your files up on the web, um, FTP, and actually, I should, I should probably change that. Um, it really, I should say SFTP um, because that's the protocol that we use. FTP is a protocol called File Transfer Protocol. And there are a number of different sort of flavors of that and options for that and a bunch of different tools that you can use uh, to be able to uh, um, talk back and forth between your local computer and the server. So this is all about transferring files from your local computer up to a server so that then any other people can access them. Um, the nice thing is that um, as you're a student here, um, we have a server space that's already set up for you, ready to use, and it's free as a part of um, the regular SOU um, IT infrastructure. And it's available to you at a uh, web address that's webpages.sou.edu slash, and then a tilde, uh, which is the little curly wave thing, um, and then your username. Um, so for me, it's last name, first initial. That's the way it's going to be for most people. Last name, first initial, maybe a number um, following that. Whatever your, your regular username for login to email, et cetera, from SOU will be that. So mine is uh, webpages.sou.edu slash tilde Bethel D is my, uh, my username there. Um, and so what that means, let me just go over here quickly to the... Uh, um, to that, I'll pull up webpages.su.edu slash tilde Bethel D. Um, if I go in just to that level, I get an error. It says forbidden um, because you don't have to have, have a root access to that level. But um, the nice thing is that by forbidden means that, it, that there's something there. It doesn't mean it's not saying like not found. So there's stuff there. Um, but if I go in, I think I probably have an EMDA 203 folder within that, which is, uh, this is, I should have prepared this one here. Uh, instead, let me go to uh, this that I know is there. Um, so this is that game that I had shown a little while ago, um, Petrie, if it's going to load up here for us. No, oh, not going to load for me. <laughs> I think you may have to call it ptree.html. I might. Let me, I'm going to look in here. Oh, no, nope, it was just slow. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, it, you, you do want to be aware of whether you're accessing a folder or accessing, accessing a specific file. So a folder, uh, remember when you're using these slashes, every time you do a slash, it gets, gets you into another la layer of folder. Um, the main thing I just want to show in here is this idea that I'm going to webpages.su.edu, going into my user account, and then whatever's after that are the files that I'm storing on the, on the server. Um, so just to see in here, now before I show you how to get in here, this is a directory that shows all my bloated um, uh, web pages files here. So I have a lot of stuff. It's all housed with inside of this public HTML folder, which I'll talk about in a minute. But if we go down here and we go alphabetical, eventually we find that there's a folder here called Petrie. And that's what it was accessing. And as long as a folder has a file called index.html, it's going to pull that up. So that's why I didn't have to have a, a, a like Petrie.html or something like that. Um, we'll go through that. But the idea is, I'm accessing a folder that I've been that I now have stored up on this um, in this remote space. So let's talk about the process of how you make this connection and how you start pushing stuff up there. Um, so uh, just to 
um, show you again on the web page here, there's a couple of different softwares that, that are sort of supported by SOU. Um, so we have some instructions of how to work with them easily. And the two ones that we recommend, there are other ones certainly as well. Uh, one is Cyberduck, um, and Cyberduck's the one that I use. Um, it's, I think maybe it originally was a Mac only, but it's, it's certainly a Mac and Windows cross-platform environment now. Um, there's a link to the download it, and then there's a link to the SOU's specific instructions. And what's great about these instructions is that when you click into them, it will show you uh, sort of line by line what you need to enter in each of the various categories. Looks like my internet, other than Zoom, is going very slow. Maybe it's because of, uh, because of Zoom. Um, so you'll be able to navigate in here, find all the stuff, and it tells you line by line what you need to put in uh, to make it work. And we'll step through that process. The same thing is, is true on for another, um, another platform called WinSCP, um, but I believe that is a Windows only um, uh, version. Um, so it's perfectly fine. You may already have something like this on your computer. Welcome to use again. There's the click link to download it and the instructions. We also have a legacy video that Miles put back or put together a couple of years ago for Cyberduck. So if you want to watch uh, through that, that's a good step by step using Cyberduck. Um, to be able to get your files up. So today I'm going to be demoing with Cyberduck because it's what I have on the computer and I know that it can exist Mac and Windows. So um, both people, both flavors should be able to make that work um, and we'll um, identify for Chrome OS um, some good options um, here in the near future as well. So um, uh, let's say, assume you've, uh, you download Cyberduck, you get it working, you'll be prompted to start with something that will just be a, a blank place and, and, and you click open connection. So you won't have these files behind you, but you say open connection. And when you do this, the first thing, and this is the one that's most easy to forget, um, but is right up here um, is choose this, this uh, pop-up menu. So the default is FTP, but what we really want is SFTP. And it's basically like a secure, um, like a more of a secure file transfer protocol. And it's the type that, um, that webpages.sou.edu needs in order to make a, a connection. So if you go through all the right steps but use FTP, it's not going to work. But if you use SFTP, it should work for you. So SFTP. And then your server is going to be uh, webpages.sou.edu. Then you shouldn't have to change anything about ports or the URL that's generated there. Your username is going to be, so this is just going to be your regular login stuff. Username, and for me, it auto-populated my password from previous. And then we should just be able to say connect. You can choose add to keychain, which means, which is going to be, it'll remember uh, for next login if you want. So connect, and it's going through the process. Perfect. Great. It worked. It let me in. Um, and what you should see when you first log in is it will bring you just to this root level, which is the public underscore HTML. Um, and what that is, is that's a folder that anything that's placed within that is going to be able to be accessible from uh, the web, accessible from people um, anywhere, as long as they have the web address uh, and you haven't put any, some other form of security in on it. Um, if I were to upload a file and put it outside of that, you know, I could still get to it, um, but other people will not have access to that. So it's important that you, the first thing I always do when I'm wanting to upload something in here is I just double click in um, to the public HTML and then sort of forget about it, at least for the time being. So now all these things are things that I put in here previously and they're all available to me. Um, so what you'll, what I'm, let's see, I'm gonna, let's see how, cluttered that is in here. Let me just create a new folder. Um, and so I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it uh, EMDA 203 uh, spring 2020. And now I'm going to click into this. So this is now sort of an empty space. This is what we, you would most likely encounter in here if you clicked in your public HTML, unless you had 
already done some work in here before. So um, this is an empty space. I have nothing in there. Um, so when I go to the process of starting to upload things that I'm working with, you want to make sure you get everything that you're going to need to access from that web page. Um, so we obviously we're going to need whatever HTML files that we're going to be working on, but we also need any images, the same file structure that you have. Um, so if your images were in an images folder, like we had uh, set up last week, um, you need to have that images folder so that the hierarchy that was established in code um, is going to be maintained here. And this is because we were using, um, let me show you back in here on Text Wrangler, for example, um, we were using these sorts of uh, um, addresses for our images, right? So it went to find the background one, it goes into an images folder and then finds background.png. This is what's called a relative path, meaning that from wherever this file that's being loaded, the HTML file is, from wherever that is, find an address that's relative to that. Go into an images file or images folder at the same location as the parent HTML file, and then go inside of that and look for this folder or for this file. That's different from, from an absolute path, which kind of like starts from the very beginning of the, of the or like the very root level of the hard drive and then tells you where to find something. So this is just important so that you don't have your website then trying to find an image on your local computer. You want the website to find the image locally or, or locally to it, which is up on the server. So here is uh, what we're going to be working with today. Um, so it is when you download it from um, under the project one underscore two um, assignment, um, down at the bottom there is a zip file to to download and you'll want to uncompress that. So either right click or control click or double click some option of that and uncompress and get it into a, the folder. And then it will look something like this. I've added one file to it. Um, so the, really the thing that I'm wanting to, well, the reason I'm wanting to bring this up is that if I want to put this up on the web, I'm really going to want to put up everything that I need to have access to. So I'm going to need the, the HTML files I'm working with, um, the images folder and the image, image files that are associated with that, as well as in this case, um, for this week, we're going to also see this JS folder, which has, um, which I guess we had it before, but we're, not have, we're using it now. It has a couple of files in here. This key monkey is a library that we'll actually start working with um, this week. So all of that stuff we're gonna to wanna to push up to the server. So um, on a Mac, um, it's just this easy, oops, um, drag and drop procedure. Um, it should be on Windows as well. That if we have our folder open, ready to go, I can just drag this whole thing over into here. And then it's going to start uploading. I get a transfer info and it's pushing it up there. And in just a second, it should be ready for me. Okay, great. And now it is up on in this space. And if I open it up, I can see yep, all those files got in there and all the subfiles got put in there. Um, and we are good to go. Um, so the in order to see this now, see it online. Um, we haven't worked with any of the code in here, but it will at least display a background for us at this point, is what you're going to need to do is find the address, the what's the web address to get to here. And this is something that, I don't know, Miles, um, if, you've, if you have a better trick on coming to this from CyberDuck or not, um, other than getting, you sort of get a link, but then you have to, you have to sort of change it here. Um, because it's- I don't have a better trick at this point okay yeah but there might be one there might be one um so so there's a little bit of a funky difference between the address that you can get from cyberduck and the and the real address you need but it's a it's a really quick fix so just follow along um what you'll need to do if you're doing cyberduck here is control click onto the the file you want to open or right click um, and then we're going to be copying or you could open um, 
but I'm just going to copy the URL and you want the HTTP URL because that's going to be the one that's not for transferring stuff, but for viewing the um, HTML file. So um, I'm going to copy that. So it now should be copied to my clipboard. And when I go to Chrome, um, I will open up a window here, new tab. I'm going to paste it in here. And if I just hit enter, you're going to get this not found. So don't panic because there's a, there's a reason for this. Um, the if we look at the web address that it provided for us for us, there's a little bit of funkiness in it that we need to clean up. Um, and this is this is the one awkward thing that it would be nice to get a fix fix on. But you see this home slash sou. We need to get rid of those and just say. Um, put on our username instead. And then we also de delete the public underscore HTML. Other than that, everything should stay the same. So really what you, what you end up wanting to see is webpages sou.edu slash tilde your username. And then from there, you're going to, to everything, you could just get this file structure from looking at how that st is structured within um, Cyberduck. Um, so if I go in here, I see that I'm at, um, I'm in the public HTML, I'm in this 203 spring 2020 folder. And within that, I went inside of this folder, and then I'm choosing this file. So it can get a little nested if you have folders within folders. Um, and I might actually recommend just for ease um, that then you start, you might start renaming some of these things so they become a little simpler. So we could say um, project one, two, for example, here might be a little cleaner um, so that then when I'm coming in here and I say project, I can just say project one, two. As long as changes happen one place, the same thing, do it here as well. So I'm going to hit enter and now it shows up. It doesn't say not found anymore. So let's, let's just look at that again real quick so that we see what parts I take away because that's, this is, um, can be a frustrating thing. So this is the, the version that is copied and pasted in if you come straight from Cyberduck. What we need to get rid of is this home SOU section. And maybe what we can do is we can make just an image on uh, Miles sometime later, later today. We can make just a little like image um, that goes into that tutorial on, on Moodle that has a, has an example of this URL that gets auto-generated, and then this is how you make it into the URL that you really need. Something okay, like I'm looking at that actually. I, there might be a way to do it. I, I'm still oh, yeah. kind of trying to track that down right now because okay. it, it, it is an annoying step. So yep. to, but that would be beautiful if there is. We've it's an annoying step that we've been doing for like five years. So <laughs> yeah, you know, and yeah. Yes, it's, it's going from the, and I think what it is, is it's switching from the FTP shortcut to the HTTP shortcut. I think uh -huh. that's the difference. So, yeah. Okay. So, let me, I'm, I'm actually digging into it right now. Okay, so. cool. Well, um, if we don't find a solution, get rid of home SOU, make sure there's a tilde before your username, and then get rid of public HTML. And also just check that you don't have double slashes. You want to just have one slash at a time in here. And then that will uh, that will work for you. I changed my path name, so there we go. Okay, so I'm sure there'll be some questions about that and some stumbling points, but don't panic when you see that not found. Um, the first step is to check the URL, make sure it's in this more sort of cleaned up version. Second step, the stack, or step in, <laughs> second step to check is to make sure that the files actually did get put up. Um, as expected in Cyberduck. Third thing is check to make sure the names are exactly the same because um, one little letter difference here is going to make it not open over there. Okay, but the nice thing is that now this means here this code that's being viewed could be viewed from anywhere. So any of you could copy this uh, web address and get it to load up on your end. Um, it's not just on my computer anymore. So that's the process of getting it, pushing it up remotely. 
So um, what I want to do also about to sh show you about this is that it's fine to keep working locally this week and then just at the very end push everything up and then make sure it's working. Um, but eventually you'll, you'll probably get in the process where you want to start keeping some of the code even as you're working up online and then refreshing it up there um, and checking and seeing if it works. Um, and that well, let's is... Let's make sure to show that. Yeah, so I'll show that right now. Um, so let me just uh, pull up the code. Which one is the, the tutorial code? I'm going to pull up my demo one. Um, great. Um, so this is a file that's not in that just that zip, but it's just it was a copy of the tutorial one, um, and I deleted a few things. Um, so if I let me pull up my cyber or trick text wrangler here. So this is the thing that I'm looking at right now, and if, for example, I were to change this background instead of to be background, I'm going to call it hero, so that the thing that it's going to be displaying is just the little character instead of my background. So if I save this, so that's important, I'm going to save. And then if I come back to the web and refresh, it's not going to change anything because I've saved it locally, but I did not update my changes at, on the server. So in order to update changes on the server, you want to go, um, like there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, you can um, just drag and drop again over or into here and it will ask you if you want to overwrite. Or if you've recently uploaded and it's in your transfer history, you can just double click on this. Right now I'm not going to, well, I'll do that this one time. If I double click on there, it's going to um, start uploading everything I had already uploaded again and overwrite that. And it may ask me as a, let me see if it gets there. Okay. Upload complete. It may ask you to over if it's okay to overwrite and just say yes. If so, um, the other way, the other thing you, the reason you might not want to do that all the time is if you pushed up a folder that had a whole bunch of data in there, it will be slower if you're going to re-upload it every time if really all you're changing is one, one file. Um, so what you might want to do instead is just change that one file, um, drag and drop it into here so that it overwrites that, and then, uh, um, and then you can just keep uploading that. So let me do that version. So I'm going to drag in this one folder or this one file, which, and it's going to ask me to overwrite. I say continue. Yes, that's fine. Um, and now, anytime I make those changes, um, it's going to be, um, let's get back to Text Wrangler. And now if I change this back to, so oh, it's hero. I want to save it. We got it pushed up there. And I'm going to refresh now. Great. It just put the hero up. So that's working. Now, if I made a change again, I want to change it back to the background. Background, save it locally, then go to, to Cyberduck, and then I can just double click on here again, just, and it's just that demo file. If I double click on it, it asks me to overwrite, and there it goes. And now um, I hit refresh, and now it's the background again. So the idea here is that you save it locally and then you push it up again and then you test it via Chrome to make sure that it's that the changes have been updated and then checking for errors and all those sorts of things as well. You know, there is a there's a way to actually skip that step mm -hmm. um, and just have it whenever you save it locally, it'll it'll update it remotely. OK, yeah, let uh, me know. I'm spacing how to do that. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> I mean, it just did it automatically. So yeah, I'll, I'll just set it up. I'll just set it up. Uh, I'll, I'll, we can make a little handout on how to do that okay. I, after the, it's not critical right now. So yeah. Great. It's just convenient. Okay. Nice. So I'm going to move on. Um, uh, but, uh, but feel free to come back and ask questions about this and don't hesitate to, to post questions or it's, it's likely that there'll be some step along this way that might, um, uh, give you a hiccup over the next week, and that's totally normal. Um, so we'll help you through that. Um, but just remember, there's there are those resources that you can check online on the Moodle page to help um, step through that process. 
and then shout out on the Discord or, or reach out to us um, to help with that. Great, so um, let's move into the, some of the fun stuff now. So um, looking towards um, making things move, first of all. We're gonna work on moving things and then getting things to have some interactivity. Um, so uh, I am going to, let's see where I'm gonna work. I'm gonna be working just for time's sake uh, to save that extra little step. I'm gonna be working locally at the moment. Um, and so I'm going to be working from here and I'm working just as a, I'm, I made a duplicate of my tutorial code and called it demo. Um, and I deleted a few other things out of there. So we'll be starting from a little bit more bare bones place to start. But what's in here um, is the starting points are gonna look pretty familiar to what we, where we started last week. Um, so we have some, we have an HTML header and then we uh, head started. We have a script that's going to be our CreateJS library. So that's the same as it has been. You'll notice that there are two other libraries that are um, that we're loading up here now. I think we're really only probably going to use the Key Monkey one first uh, for this week, um, but uh, we'll throughout the term we'll end up using both of those. So it's good to just sort of have them up there in case you do end up using them. Um, Key Monkey is a library that um, Adam Calloway put put together. Um, who's taught for EMDA classes um, in the past. I think Miles might have had a hand in, in both of these as well. Um, uh, and so KeyMonkey is a library that's for working with keyboard input and making it sort of taking some of the headaches of getting um, keyboard input to, to work easily and smoothly. And Collision Gnome has to do with making uh, uh, things detect when, they've, when they touch. So if two images are moving, and then they and then they start to overlap in some way. Collision GNOME checks that and and can do things as a result. Um, so it detects a collision and then and then we'll do something. Um, we'll probably start doing that a little bit more um, in the near future. Dealing with that, um, I'm going to skip over some of this detailed stuff up here at the moment. These are just some more global variables that have been added in for uh, for your use later. Um, but then we get into our initialization. We have our init function. Um, and in here we've created our stage as we did before. There are two different things that we've, that we've have here that we hadn't used before, which is the idea of, of getting the value for the width and the height of our canvas. So this might be useful for us down the road if we want to be able to place something within our stage, um, in a way that, uh, that you don't just have to keep typing in the numbers. You don't have to just remember like how big was the, the width, how, how high was it, how wide was it. Um, so what this is doing is it's using a dot notation. We go into my stage, which we created as the stage element in CreateJS. Go in and get the canvas element within that, which was the HTML element, and it has a property of width and the property of height. And so then these variables that we defined as stage width and stage height just simply get updated with the values that if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, um, we'll see the canvas had a width and a height and here just equal 1024. Um, but if we were to change that, those things will get updated. So we don't have to go back through our code and, and make updates to that. If we change here, it will auto update as a result. So that's a kind of nice slick little feature. Um, we're adding in an, a background image to our stage and by pulling in the bitmap and positioning it, in this case, positioning it at zero, zero, which is the default. So you wouldn't have to do that, but that gives you, sort of reminds you uh, to, that you do need to position files, position images. And then it adds it to the stage, add, ch add child, and then the name of the variable that holds the image. So that's all review. And hopefully that was all working for everyone this past week. Um, and we would do the same, which we will in a moment, um, to get a, a character added in there. I'm actually just going to um, all uncomment that. So now we'll basically have our hero going <clears throat> and just display it here. And at the end of that, all that mess, um, my stage add child hero. Okay, and then we have down here this, these parts that we saw last week, but we didn't really utilize them too much. Um, CreateJS ticker, where we are creating an event listener, which means every time the ticker sends a tick, which is basically like a new frame, 
it's going to call a new function here. And this one is called draw new frame. Um, uh, I wonder if I should, if I should have changed these, maybe we should change these to the, to be what we had them last week, the game loop stuff, you think? Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. That'd be good. Yeah. I, I, I spaced it too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe we'll get, we'll get the, uh, we'll do a new push of this, of these files, um, directly after class, um, that will have these value, these things, um, uh, set up the way we, that you saw them last week. Um, so that will be a, there'll be a game loop and then there will probably be also a, uh, um, init game, right? Init game function. Uh, sorry about that. Right now it'll just do nothing, but it'll be, it'll be like that. So you'll see that stuff. Um, okay, so our so every tick our game loop function is called, and the game loop function is going to be like anything that needs to be updated over time is going to be happening every tick, like every think about every frame, it's going to be updated. And here we just say instead of saying specifically sixty in terms of the fret set frames per second, we use a variable. We say my frame rate, and we can define that up above. So that if we decide we want to change it, all all the big changes that we want to test. Um, we can just go up to the global variables and edit them up there, which is usually a good way to work. Okay, um, so that's happening. Let's just, I'm just going to save and pop over to Chrome and make sure that now um, something's happening. Okay. Hero start position X is not defined. Okay. Um, I'm not going to worry about, about that right now. So it, if you get so something's not defined, it means that it's looking for something that's not there. Um, in this case, there were some things, additional things that I just needed to comment or uncomment. So let me try it again. There we go. Great. So now we have our background. Now we have a um, character image in there, hero image. So what I'm working my way towards is just getting some movement happening. Um, and then we'll come back and look at some of these other things in detail. So are if we want to move the hero we need to be able to remember first of all what thing are we going to move and it's simply going to be this hero uh, variable that that has a starting position and it has the image associated with it all that good stuff uh, it's been registered so that the anchor point is in the middle of it and and also we created this thing this is a fun thing just to sort of see that we can we'll play with in a minute is that this there's a hero dot speed and it's getting this variable here, uh, hero start speed, which had been defined up here somewhere. Um, had it? Yes, right here as five. Okay, and we'll see what that is in a moment. Um, but the nice thing about that, or the neat thing in my mind, is that this dot speed is not a known property to a bitmap. It's not something that a, like an, a regular image file just ha has a speed property. Um, that's kind of a cool thing about JavaScript is it's easy to add elements in there. So we could we can say hero dot hair color um, and then assign it some value of I'm not looking at what it's probably blue. Is it blue? Is there even hair? Doesn't matter. Um, I can I can assign a property here and give it a value so that then I could access it later. So that this hero's hair color is now a known thing to the software even though hero or hair color was not something that CreateJS knew about. So that's kind of a cool thing. So that's what's happening here with the speed is we're adding a speed so that it'll be a default speed that the hero can move at. And let's see how we'll apply that in a second. So move down to the game loop because that is where we're going to be making things move. So if we take our hero, <clears throat> what, is a, what is a property of the hero that deals with position that we might be able to update so that we could make it move. And can someone shout out or, or throw it in the chat there? What's a property of our hero, if I come up into here, that we would want to access in, in thinking about making it move? 
uh, you'd want the hero.x and hero.y values to change. Nice, thank you. Exactly, yeah, so position, and if you change position, that's movement. Um, so if we come down here, we can say hero.x, and since we're in a loop that we want something to change every tick, every frame is gonna change, we wanna think about incrementing stuff. So some of the very simplest ways that we could do this is that hero.x has some position and we could increment it by one. So if you remember, we could say hero.x plus plus. Remember when we did that variable plus plus? It's just a way of making it add one to it every time. So let me save that. This is gonna be the very basic way that we could start. And I'm gonna refresh here. And hey, look at that, it's moving. We have a game, we have, or well, we have animation. We don't have an interactivity, but we have, we have motion happening. And then let's see what happens. It, let me hide my console there. Okay, and then the character just slowly backs off the stage because character has nothing else yet left to say. So um, we could also do hero x minus minus. I'll save my changes, come back here and refresh, and it goes the other way. So it's subtracting every frame. If we go back and look, its starting position was, um, it, on the X, it was at 200. And so one, one tick, it's at 200. The next one, it's at 199. Next one, 198, 197, 196, et cetera. And it's doing that every frame, it's gonna be subtracting one there. So, great. Uh, let's say we want it to move faster. Well this plus plus method isn't gonna work for us any longer because that's really only increments by one. But we can do, if you remember the plus equals is another option, another way we did incrementing. So if I could say plus equals 10 and save that. So that means every frame, it's going to add 10 to it. So it'll be at 200, 210, 220, 230, et cetera. So save that, refresh. And you notice I can just keep refreshing. Every time I refresh the page, it will start back at that starting point because we had a defined initial location um, in, the, uh, in the code up here, that 200, 100. Um, so it will just keep going sort of infinitely. So this, that character is still going somewhere. Um, and we could actually find that out if we wanted, but it's, it's probably at you know, 10,000 or something by now. Um, it's way off there. So um, same thing, we could do minus, uh, minus equals to increment that way. Here, instead of a hard-coded number, what we um, often wanna do is have some idea of, of a, a value that's in relationship to the speed. So if, instead, we, since we set a speed property, we can say plus equals hero.speed, which I remember was set to be five. Um, so now we can come in and Increment it, it's going at five. And I did that without using a hard-coded number. I used a variable instead. So great. The nice thing about that is that we could change that later or we could have multiple different characters that have dot speed properties. And you could say, give me character dot speed value and make it move in relationship to that. Um, so, what are some other things um, that we might want to be able to do before we start getting into control with the with the mouse or with the uh, um, keyboard? So there's there's sort of an obvious one. What would, might we want to not happen? Where did he go? Where did he go? Yeah. So maybe when um, the character gets to some place over here, do something. So. We, what uh, what's a couple of things we could do? I could think of two options. There's there's lots of other options. But what could we do when the character gets to some spot here? Let's let's go with uh, let's make it. Um, I'll do this the the easiest one first. I'll make it refresh its location so it sort of like hits a a force field over here and it gets sent back to the start point. Okay, let's do that one. So we're entering into the world of conditionals. So if the character moves and gets, gets to the edge of the stage, go back to the starting point. So 
if hero dot x is now let's think about that here um, so that we know that the the width of this is 1024 so we could use that value actually stage width and we know we, we don't want to get all the way over like so it's missing so it's off the screen but maybe right before that so I'm going to say um, if hero dot x is greater or equal to stage width um, minus the uh, 128. I'm doing 128 because that was twice the width, or that's the width of my character in there. And stage width is a thing, good. And I'm gonna say stage width minus 128. And if the hero is greater than or equal to that, then we'll do whatever is in here. So then what's in there? Well, we'll just say hero dot x is going to be equal to hero, what was it, start position x, something like that. Hero start position x. Yeah. Great. So let me save that and we'll try it out and we can look at it again. So see if it works. Okay, it's working. And sorry if it's, I, I don't, it might be laggy or jumpy on your side, uh, seeing the animation stuff happening. So, yeah, it's, it's happening. So every frame, we update his position by a little bit by the speed amount. Um, and then if the hero is far enough to the right that it is greater than or equal to the stage width minus sort of the, the thickness of the character, then shift him back to that starting point. Yeah. So nice. Um, let's see if we'll do one other, we'll do one other version here. Okay. So let's say instead that we wanted, instead of jumping back, let's say we wanted it to be every frame, if it gets far enough over that it just stops. Okay, so how could we do that, given that every frame we know it's going to be adding hero speed to it? Well, a kind of a tricky way is that we could we can change his speed, because speed is a property there we have. So we could say hero dot speed gets zero, which means don't move. Okay, so let me save that and then try it and let's see what happens here. So now if we refresh. Moves, 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 and stopped. Great. Okay, that works pretty pretty well. Um, so that is a way of, um, again, just using the basic uh, conditional and if if then statement. Um, if it gets to a certain location, stop the speed. And there we go. We'd have to do some more complicated stuff to get it so that then it would be able to restart and et cetera. But um, I don't think we need to go into that right now. Okay, so let's now um, move a little bit from this uh, this sort of way of working to starting to apply keyboard input to it. Does that seem like a good next step? Um, so um, this was sort of one way of approaching it. And oftentimes you might have objects that you want to be moving on their own um, without key keyboard input. You know, like if you had some, some uh, asteroids or something that are flying across, you want them to just be moving and updating on their own based on their own speed. And you could imagine kind of neatly um, that if we created, ended up creating an array that hold, held a bunch of asteroids, you could use random numbers and create um, random speed properties for each of those asteroids. So you could have 100 asteroids and each one has a slightly different speed so that they're not, they're not all just moving as one monolithic thing, but they, some could be moving faster, some could be slower, et cetera. Um, so the, the system I set up here, it would be good for that. So you're updating it based on that speed property um, every frame. But if you want to be moving based on your um, keyboard input, you don't want to always be moving. You only want to be moving if the keyboard is, um, is depressed in a particular way. So I'm going to comment out this stuff. So let's look at this key monkey um, thing. Um, and 
to use KeyMonkey, um, what I'm going to do is every time that there is a frame or a tick, I'm going to want to go out and check um, what's happening with the keyboard. And I'm actually going to do this with a standalone function, which is set up in these tutorials for this week. Um, rather than doing it in the game loop itself, which you could do, but oftentimes it's really nice to keep your main game loop as clean and compact as possible because it's going to make your debugging a lot easier. So if you know that in your um, game loop, basically all there is is a section, there's, it says handle the keyboard, move targets, um, update score, and a couple other like very sort of high level things get happen or happen. And then within those, you, you call out to those functions and then that's where all the details happen. It just really helps with workflow because if you add all that in one big loop, you, it's easy to get lost. So um, down below, there's a function called handle keyboard input that we, that we created for you as a starting point. Um, so inside of here, it shows you the basic syntax that you're going to want to use um, both to access if uh, KeyMonkey is getting a key to work, um, as well as how to get something to move in relationship to that. So um, where's the end of that? There, it's right there. Um, so I'm going to just uncomment these like that. And I'll just clean these up a tiny bit so it's obvious what's happening. So the structure for working with KeyMonkey is uh, like this. Um, and it, you can use a, a conditional. And you say, if um, KeyMonkey, and what does this look like when you have these square bra um, brackets? What, what object have we seen programming-wise that uses square brackets before? I see an A, <laughs> an A array. Yep, A is for array. Um, so uh, this, is, this is a type of an array. It's call, a call out to an array, right? Um, so KeyMonkey, if we were to go in and look at it, must have a defined array that's called KeyMonkey. And so let's actually, let's take a look for a second at KeyMonkey itself. And I'm not gonna go too detailed into it, but just to see um, what it looks like. And it is nicely commented and uh, more legible than the CreateJS library um, because it was written with the intent that we would um, be, um, be showing it to y'all. Um, so in here, the very first thing is that it defines a, an array called KeyMonkey. So, yep, we were right about that. And basically what's going to happen is that each key, um, whether it's a letter, a number, an up, down, etc., cetera, um, is going to have a, an element in the array that gets told to be whether it's true or false. And so if the key is down, that um, element of the array is going to be true. And if it's not, that element of the array is going to be false. So that's using that Boolean, remember, false and true. Um, so if we look back at our code that we're working through now, this structure will make a little bit of sense, hopefully. So remember, we, we say if KeyMonkey W, um, let's ignore all this part right now, but if KeyMonkey W, it doesn't say greater than or equal to or it or equals true or anything. Because remember, you can use a conditional that's that's saying like this. If we said if um, uh, like, I'll just do it up here real quick, var um, Bob gets true. If Bob is true, so we could say if Bob is equal to true, do whatever. Um, but we could also say, we could just say, if Bob, because since Bob is a Boolean um, variable, it's only true or false. You say, if Bob means, if it's true, do this. If Bob is true, do this stuff. And remember, the opposite of that was, if not Bob, which would be like, if false. OK, 
Okay, so that's what's happening down here, is it's saying um, that if key monkeys array associated or array element associated with W returns true, and these two straight slashes is an or, or key monkeys up returns true, then do this line of code. So this is so you can do the W um, ASD as your control or your arrow keys as a control, because W is gonna do the same as the up key. And what is it doing? It's taking the, in this case, the Y, so the up and down property, and it's subtract equaling, so it's incrementing it by the hero.speed property. And same for all the other keys, all their other commands in there. So great, let's, um, let's save this. So really all I'm having to do is uncomment this um, to make use of that structure. Um, and I'm making sure that my, this isn't gonna conflict with it, what I had done before, I'd commented out that. Okay, and then let's come over and check, refresh. And hey, I'm using keys and I'm getting some movement. Um, sometimes that happens if you're, stage is bigger than your um, bigger than your display window. Sometimes things move kind of funkily, funky ways. Um, I sh you can shrink out, um, scale out to get a better view of that. So now I mo can move left and right using arrow keys and up and down using arrow keys and same using the WASD commands to do the same. Nice. So, uh, questions. Uh, I haven't been keeping up with the, with the chat, but are there questions about how this is happening or things that I've skipped over? Seem pretty good so far? Okay. Nice. Um, so that's the, uh, um, yep, that's what we're, what we're doing. We got it moving via keyboard input, and we also were able to move some things based on just uh, single values or by, by incrementing them in the main loop itself. So let's, um, what should we do now, Miles? Should we add, add some targets or add a target or something? What do you well, think? let's see. Yeah, let's do that because then we can have those. So then we have the difference between animation that the player is controlling. Mm -hmm and animation that's happening purely procedurally. That's just the computer is making things animate. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we can start to play around with that. Okay, yep, um, but quickly first there was a, a question. Um, what about diagonal direction? So uh, uh -huh. yeah, good question. You can, uh, maybe you can see that I'm able to do that um, just by holding both keys down at the same time. Um, so this is a nice library in that it is able to check if more than one key is being deployed at once. So that if I am adding in the X dimension and I'm adding in the Y dimension, you're gonna go diagonally down. If you're gonna be subtracting in the Y and subtracting in the X, you're gonna go diagonally up one, one way or the other. So all those different combinations. Um, so it's really a combination of two keys at once. And yeah, Kitty, it's a good question because um, the diagonal thing is interesting because we just get that in this setup for free. Like we don't have to calculate something differently. It's just because it's adding one in the X direction and it's adding one at the Y direction, which are two separate properties. What it's doing is there's a frame. It, it, you tell it where to draw a frame at a particular X and Y. Then the ticker goes, right? And then there's no actual transition. It just takes that off the stage and throws it in the trash. And then it redraws it again at a new X and Y position. So that's all that's happening, which is really weird. It's just saying, it's just saying you give me the numbers for X and Y and I'll draw it there. But what happens is you get this natural diagonal movement from that. So it's kind of cool. Um, and you'll see later on, actually, you can do, you can program something with direction as a property. I think Cody had mentioned that in a comment I saw earlier on chat. 
And so direction is actually more complicated because then you have to calculate the angle. You have to tell it, oh, I want to move this 33 degrees at this speed. That's a totally different thing than this. This is like a, th these two separate properties and just say, oh, redraw it here, redraw it here, redraw it here. So it's, it's actually an interesting question. Like it, 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 there, there, there's a, a more complicated version down the road that we'll get into, but this is just kind of magical. So like something like Pong, that, that was amazing to me, like, you know, seven or eight years ago, the first time I, I looked at that, how to do that is that Pong just works. Like there's no calculation about it. <laughs> like bouncing. It's just, you're changing something from positive to negative. So it just works. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it yeah. is. It's like, uh -huh. yay. <laughs> yeah. And because sometimes when you get, you know, just remembering back from math stuff, um, when you're sometimes doing things on diagonals can get trickier. Like if you're wanting to calculate distances and stuff like that, you have to start using distance formulas. You can't just subtract X and Y, like figure out what the actual distance is. You start getting into trigonometry and stuff like that. So diagonals, sometimes you think, yeah, it's got to be a little trickier, but in this case, as Miles says, you get it for free. Um, so yeah, let's add in um, a, at least one character or one target. Maybe I'll add in some more and we'll get them moving in some different ways. So um, in here, I'm gonna take, uncomment this section. Um, so we're adding in a new target that has a target PNG image and we're going to place it here. Notice what we're doing is we're placing it with a random number um, that is limited by the stage width. So we don't know where um, X to Y or on the X left to right is going to be, but it'll be somewhere within the stage because of um, the stage width property. So math.random times stage width. Then it's Y, we're just setting to be 32. And we're also creating a randomized speed. Um, so the way that this is done is, is basically that way we looked at before when we were generating random numbers within a range you're multiplying a the maximum possible speed by a random number and then shift and then shifting it by adding the minimum speed so up here we had must have created some variables that said target min and target max so it's again the max is going to be 4 the min is 2 so when we come down here um, it says this number is 4 so a random number between 0 and 1 times 4 is going to give you a number between um, zero and four. And then this is going to add two to that so that you know that the slowest it will go is going to be two, but it really is going to be between two and six and some sort of a floating point number in there. And then it adds it to the stage. Great. So now I have this target O1 as something that I can talk to here. So let's use the code that I had used before, but going to convert it to being target O1. So the stuff I got working with our hero, I can just simply say target 01 and target 01. So let's just start there. And this is, it's always good to incrementally, especially at the beginning, incrementally code, like code align, check it, code align, next line, check it. Um, because otherwise you get a whole bunch, like a whole block of text there. And then you go back to check it and you have errors. Um, it's harder to know where the error came from. Okay, so let's refresh. Okay, awesome. We got a little target up there and it's moving and there it goes and it's gone. Okay, so let's do something with this now. Um, again, based on what we had done before, um, I'm going to say once it gets to a certain location uh, to restart. But what I wanna do is let's make it once it actually is off the stage, um, then tell it to start back over on the other side. So it seems like it's coming from nowhere um, and then it goes across the stage and then, and then goes somewhere else. So I'm actually want it to start here X rather than random place. I'm going to tell it to start at um, negative uh, 64. So it's going to be just off to the left as a starting point. And then we're going to say, um, to that same spot. I could set that up as a, as a variable, which would probably be a good idea, but 
Um, let's leave it like that and see what happens. Okay, so now refresh. It came out, came from the left, and it's going, 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 it's going. And what happened? Okay. No errors, but where is it? Let me see here. Watch this. Let's see if I can get this happening in the so in the JavaScript console. You'll get a lot of errors, which is great. Uh, so if you see errors there, but you can also ask it things. You can also like find out stuff about um, your assets. So I could say target zero one dot um, x, and it just gave me what that value was. It says eight thousand five hundred and three. Okay, so it's still going out there. And if I were to uh, to check in now, it's at ten thousand. Okay. So but that's kind of cool. Just a line there, this line here on this um, console, you can type in things and find out other stuff. So I could say target 01. If I just hit enter, it will tell me everything about what target 01 is. So there's a whole bunch of info in there. And somewhere in there, there should be an X and a Y. Yep, down here. So anyway, just a ni nice trick to get uh, used to for debugging. Okay, so let me look at the code and see why it's still moving. Ah, uh, okay. Can anyone see why it's still moving? In this chunk here. Right here. So hero, I my conditional, I changed all my target 01s or my hero to target one, but I forgot to do it here. So it was checking to see if the hero um, got all the way over to the right. Um, so if the hero got all the way over to the right, then this would get uh, the way it was where it was supposed to be. So let's just see, because it's kind of humorous. Um, see what happens here. I'll move this guy all the way off stage and see if then. Oh, darn. I was hoping magically. Oh, yep, yeah, it did. OK, it did get him to start again. So if he comes back on, okay. So some fun, some weird interactivity. It's not what I what I was really wanting, but but you can see how things then can be connected. So that the movement of this um, character is now sort of tied to that movement of a little target. So let's get it the way that we wanted it. Target 01. So now, theoretically, when it when this gets over to here somewhere, it should restart. Okay, great. Nice. Pac-Man fever. Yeah. So let's just do this. Uh, uh, I'm just going to add a couple more, um, a two and a three, just so we can see how that's going to work. I just need to change the two ones to twos. Just make sure you're as comprehensive as you can, because if you leave one dangling, whoops, um, you run into problems that way. This is what we're going to be avoiding in the coming weeks. Like uh -huh. we're just showing you kind of like a very literal way to do this. Um, but like we've said, it would get annoying if you had to do this like 25 times or 500 times. So, but this, this week it's good practice just to kind of go, Oh, that's what this is. I'm, I'm setting the X position for each thing. I'm setting the Y position. And then you can see, the variation that happens. That's really what this week is about, is just so you get a chance to play with this stuff and see cause and effect. Yep. Happening. Yeah. Yeah. And so eventually, you know, if you're if you're feeling good about this, this would be stuff to start pushing into arrays. Um, so you'd be able to push all your targets into an array and then step through or iterate through the array and update the speed of each element of the array and check all that kind of stuff. Um, so we'll, but we'll be working with that for you shortly. So I'm doing it the, the heavy lifting way to, well. Right, because this is the classic thing that you would want to avoid doing. But we're just having this week is just make sure you get it. And then once you get this, the next week will make sense. Yeah. So and you'll be happy <laughs> that you're like, oh, yeah, I don't have to do that anymore.
Okay. <laughs> so there were two that were basically the same speed. They're slowly separating out from each other. But it's working. Yep. And so, you know, then we, we the, the thing that happens now is you start getting into, or I start moving towards thinking about design really at this stage. Then it's like, okay, great, I got these things moving. Now, how do I design it to be an experience that I want it to be? Like, what kind of interaction do I want it to be? What do I think would be cool? Um, it would be neat to have like a lot more of these. It need be, be neat to have them at different heights. Um, it might be neat to have some of them bounce off the back um, would be, might be an interesting one. Um, so all those things are, are things that we can kind of explore. Um, and I'll do, we'll do just a little bit of that now. Um, but then, um, you know, these things we can push forward more later as well. So let's make, um, let's play with, because this is a useful thing, I think, the idea of, of bouncing and getting them to go back and forth um, so that one's moving left to right and then it goes right to left at some point. So let's look in here and we'll just do it for one at the moment, for target 01. So we want to change directions before you get off the stage. So we're going to go back to stage width minus some amount um, and I'll just take 64 off of it, something like that. Um, so I'm just going to save that and look back here, refresh. And now as one of them jump when it's there, yep, it was that first one. It jumps when it gets there, whereas the other ones are going all the way off when it's there. So now um, that's good. So, but instead of jumping, which is what this did, I want it to change direction. So anyone have ideas, what would be good uh, ways that you could change direction? So, you know, we could minus equals something like increment it backwards some way, but that's gonna, but every time you go through this loop, it's going to try and add to it and then it's gonna try and take away from it, which is kind of a, a weird thing. Are there any properties that, that are available to us that we could alter? I'll go right for it. Uh, so the, uh, um, the uh, and it's one that sometimes you don't think about because um, the X is associated with position, but then we have this speed property, right? And you can have a negative speed. So if a negative speed would mean you're adding a, a negative value each time around. So if we were to say um, target on speed equals, um, we could say negative five or whatever it was, but that we actually can't say really say negative five because when it was generated, when the speeds were generated, we see up here they're generated in a random way. So it's a random number between two and six. So unless we were to save that, we don't really know what it is, but luckily it is saved for us, right? It's that target one speed, and we can just invert it by putting a negative sign in front of it. So we say negative target 01.speed. So if the current target speed was five, target speed now is going to get negative five. So it's gonna flip its direction here. So let's test that and see. So I'm going to get rid of the other two. So we're just looking at the one because it's gonna get confusing otherwise. Um, so I'll just not add those to the stage. Oh, that's gonna give me a problem though. These down here. So we'll just not move them. Okay. Okay, here's our one coming. It's coming. Hey, and it went back. Okay, so good news. Now, of course, the, what do we wanna do? We wanna get it to bounce back the other direction so it goes in a, in a perpetual bounce. So maybe we can extend our conditional so that if it's, um, if the Y or the X is greater than some amount or it's less than some amount. So we just saw our OR when we came through the uh, key monkey. So it's these two vertical lines or, I'm gonna 
copy and paste, or this less than or equal to zero uh, 64. So zero plus 64, which is redundant. You don't need to put that, so 64. Okay, and then we just got to make sure that our um, starting point is sort of within those bounds, actually. So I want to make sure our starting point, what's our starting point? Negative 64. So I'm going to throw it into the middle of our stage. Um, here's a neat little trick. We could say stage width divided by two gives you the middle of something. So now if we refresh, it started in the middle, bounce. Let's start going faster. Uh -huh. Kind of looked like it. Okay, we've got bounce, and this guy can still move. Okay, so that bounce really is achieved by having a conditional on both ends. So if it gets too big or if it gets too small, change the speed to be the inverse of that. So if it was five, change the speed to negative five. If it's negative five, change the speed to, to positive five. Um, nice, so we could just do the same thing for the others. And I'll just do it, copy and paste quick. And we'll just see the last sort of version of that. Okay, and get these back up and running. There we go. And starting points, we just need to have the starting points be same. Okay, refresh. Boing. Okay, and they're all moving at their own speed. Great. Just for my sake, I'm going to change the Y's and then we'll be done. Math.random. Times stage height. A nice way to do that. So a random number within the, the height of it. And same for up here. Okay, there they go. Can he avoid them? Can he avoid the objects? It's frightening. I think I can do it. Okay, so that is really the, the goal um, for the end of this week. It's some, some version of this. You don't have to have the, the targets moving in this specific way, um, but some way of getting some targets um, here, some things moving around, a character moving around. Um, and again, as we had worked through before, you can choose whether you want to work simply with the, um, the assets that we're providing, these, and these uh, drawings that uh, Miles has created, or if you want to work with your own images, that's certainly possible as well. Um, we do want you to keep thinking and keep starting to work towards um, your own images. So if you use your own images for um, for this last week, the one that was due last night, great. I recommend you continue with that. Um, if you haven't done any of that yet, it's a good idea to start getting into that process so you're not sort of jammed up at the end of the term trying to figure out to get you, how to get your own images working or made and working in with the code. So yeah, so what questions are there about about any of this good stuff? I know. I think Miles and Rad have been answering some things out there. So I, I just wanted to um, point out, I mean, like a big part of this week and like David's breaking it all down for us is to, we're starting to think like a computer. Um, and there was a question here from Jorge that I thought was a great question. Um, that if you can start to break everything down more and more and more and more, and um, which I think a, a great way to start Brad had talked about this too, is pseudo coding is starting to kind of, if you can articulate it to yourself first, 
then so the question Jorge had was is there a way to make the object disappear or fade away rather than rolling off the screen that's a great question right and so my short answer was yes there is uh, but uh, you know if you start to think about it that's kind of what this whole thing is about is that you go oh I wonder what would happen if I made it turn right instead of left then you get a chance to try it out um, so um, where was I going with this oh yeah so like learning how to break things down more and more and more it might seem absurd but I was just thinking about it like um, if you don't know anything about fixing a car and you got a job working at a car garage and the boss said, oh, hey, uh, David, go uh, take that Ford F-150 out back and pull the radiator on it. You know, you'd be like, interesting. Like, what's a radiator? <laughs> you know, or once I know what a radiator is, how do I pull it? And why, you know, like we, we don't, and that's kind of where we're at is like, we don't really know almost what we're even talking about. So to get used to it, if you say, okay, what's a radiator? Where's the radiator on a Ford F-150? Mm -hmm. Where are the bolts? Yeah. Pull it, all that kind of stuff. So we're kind of going da, da 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 So that's a great thing to start. But the good news is that if you start to think about it and say, all right, well, let me think about the same structure that we just, so the, the structure would be the same in this, in, the, in this case. You'd say, if the object's X position exceeds a certain number, then something happens. So, and then those were actually two different things, you know, like then fade the object out, okay? cool what then the next step would be okay what does it mean to fade something out to a computer right we know what it means but would a computer know what that is and then how do i do that and then what was the other one was uh or disappear so disappear is kind of like fading in and out but if we get rid of the fade part we could there's probably a way to just say oh like let's take it off the screen and there are uh methods for all actually both of those things so and longer answer would be, you know, we could look in the CreateJS library. And it's kind of related to Katie's question here. Um, uh, Katie says, can we talk a bit about using sprite sheets to animate the character? Um, so that's actually, again, totally down. You can start looking this stuff up uh, in the CreateJS library. Um, but you're actually introducing a, a new factor so and that makes things like way more complicated in terms of in one way one way maybe not that that complicated um but there are many more steps for each thing and so like the the, the difference between fading something versus disappearing i think is also a bit more kind of like that too so these are these are good questions um, and see if you can think them through and maybe do some digging on it and see what you can come up with. Uh, and then we'll definitely cover both of those things, uh, maybe even next week. So we'll take a look at it. Yeah, good. And Rad's saying, yeah, you can send, a, send some code out. We can take a look at it. Yeah. Cool. Great. And maybe yeah. we can, oh, sorry. I was just going to say maybe too, if we get, David and I were just talking about this a little bit last week. Like if people are wanting to go ahead a little bit, maybe this week we'll shoot. I'm just getting that code up so you guys can jump ahead. And that way you could see both of those things in action, both Jorge's and Katie's question. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, I think it's, yeah, just echoing that, the, the idea that there's sort of a minimal set of things that we're really going to be teaching and making sure that everyone is able to, has a great grasp of these core concepts. Um, and there's always going to be, not that these are, these examples are particularly really advanced. I think they're useful things for a lot of gaming, obviously. Um, um, but there might be some things that, that we don't require you to be able to do, um, but you're still interested in, in making happen. So, so there's going to be sort of a minimum amount that we're expecting for the final version of these projects. Um, but then but don't limit yourself to that. If you're wanting to figure out more, um, you, you know, use us as resources to, to go further because we can 
really sort of trick out these these games to be more and more advanced. We have that kind of demo section. Maybe we can bring that back in. You know, like, like, I'll, we can put that back in the bottom or something mm -hmm. if people want to. We'll have a. We'll, so we'll do that, you guys. We'll we'll have the scary section. <laughs> oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I know some people are wanting to get scary, so we can we can get scary. So we can. Uh, uh, but you don't have to. If yeah. You, if you if you're terrified, well, we can keep it strictly PG or something. I don't know. But yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of that stuff is in on the Moodle page under these the libraries and additional resources. We can go down and see. Oh, more is that and up more. already? Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Was, mm -hmm. Oh, okay, cool. Yep. Yeah. Um, so there's a sprite sheet demo. Yep. Um, and just briefly, a sprite sheet is just it's basically the thing at the top of our Moodle site. It's it's a it's one image with a bunch of images on it, but the computer doesn't know. The computer doesn't look at this and say, oh, there's some kind of like cephalopod creature with horns on it. It doesn't recognize that as anything. It just recognizes that recognizes it as a picture. And then what we're, all we're doing is we're giving it X and Y values to say, oh, these, these, have, these are all uh, every 64 pixels by 64 pixels or whatever, that's a picture, that's a picture, that's a picture. So it's kind of cutting it up by giving it a set of coordinates to cut it up. And then it's calling a different picture to draw on the stage as we want it to happen. So that's the, sh that's the short, short intro yep. to that concept. Yep. Nice. Um, yeah. So actually there you can see where it says Thornton at the top. Um, it's saying uh, those are the, the list and those were a long, it was a longer picture, but like, Oh, the idle sequence is frames one through three. And those got, we cut those off because it was so big. But then there's like, um, like the grab sequence is frames 27 through 31. So you, you're specifying little pieces of that to run at different times, depending on the situation. So again, it's conditional thinking. It's like, if the character is moving right, then play the moving right cycle which is frames, you know, uh, move right, 17 through 21. So it's going to play 17 through 21. So that's all happening with if then. And one last spoiler alert for this. It took me a long time to really grasp the idea that movement, like David's showing us today, is completely has nothing to do with sprite animation. So that's a completely separate property which is interesting. Like it, we don't think about those two things as being separate, but they, they have nothing to do with each other at all in programming it. They're just, here's a thing, movement. Here's a completely unrelated thing, sprite animation. But the way we combine them makes it look like they're intimately very closely related. So yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um... Great, yeah. Um, so yeah, so there is more stuff down below that you're welcome to to check in on. Um, but for reminder for this week, under week five, it's this project one two control movement with keyboard input and conditionals, which is really what we showed today. Inside, if you haven't downloaded it, there there's the zip file, uh, zip folder that has the stuff we were working on. Um, a fair amount of the stuff is just sort of uncommenting and getting to work with your own um, stuff, um, but play around with that. Um, it it's, is really neat once you get your stuff, uh, your own images in there working uh, and it can, can inspire those questions um, like Jorge and, uh, and others are saying of like, well, I want to be able to do this or how do I make this happen? Those sort of questions are um, really that's how I, always, how I learn code is by like having something I want to be able to figure out um, and then figuring out how to do that and then at least minimally remembering aspects of how I did it. So the next time I can do it again, um, more so than the idea that like, I just, I learned code and then I, then I developed a project. Um, it was, I'm doing projects and I'm figuring out the solutions to the very specific things I need to do as I'm going. Um, and over time I start learning more best practices of what works best and how, how to do things more efficiently, both for myself and for the computer and, and stuff like that. So. Um, it's very much, a, I think, a project-based learning is the is the best 
way. So setting yourself those kind of goals of like, okay, I'm, I'm following along with what's here, but maybe if you want to get more advanced, think about the stuff that you want to be able to have happen and start trying to figure out how, how might you do that. Um, and of course, some cases we might have the answer and be able to just say, hey, do this. Um, but sometimes the, the, the best learning practice is that fighting through and, and doing a little web searching and figuring out what, what things can I control using CreateJS, what things can't I, and how do I do it otherwise? All that's kind of starting to figure things out is really that's, that's sort of a very productive um, thing, a productive methodology. That's great. Yeah, totally. And I, 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 I'm the same way that, that you kind of, if you can get like, oh, I want to do this, so how do I do it? <laughs> That'll take you, take you far. And That's 100% the way that I've learned how to do most of this too. Right on. Yeah, so, it, and I think probably most people that have done this would do this. And it's interesting if you, like, a lot of times in like a, another class, they'll just say, oh, we're just going to start here and go through da, 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 whether or not you know why you're wanting to do it. And I, I think, it, yeah, but starting with your why, what do you want to do? This is why I want to do it. Then that can take you there. And I think learning how to think like a computer, which is not the way that we naturally think is really important. So what we've covered this first four weeks actually is really powerful that everything you figure out is going to come down to the understanding you've developed. You're starting to develop right now. So what we're doing, it's kind of, it might feel like baby steps sometimes, but ultimately it's not, it's actually a different way of thinking about things. Um, so starting to think in terms of what the computer does well, like conditionals computer is kind of built on the idea of conditionals. Is it a one or is it a zero? Like everything that we're seeing right now in the computer is happening because it fits that logic. Um, so the more you can kind of get that, you realize like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to translate my thoughts into, which are not wrong, <laughs> by the way, your, your thinking isn't wrong. But as it applies to the computer, it's learning how that transition happens. So, uh, and that's the fun part of it. That's what I think is really exciting about it. Nice. Well, um, I think that's basically what we want to cover this time, right? Yep. Um, yep. So I think we're probably pretty good. We can hang out for a few minutes if there's other questions. And then yeah, we'll... if people have questions about homework from last week or yeah. whatever or stuff, you know, we can cover all that too. Yeah, that sounds good. And then we'll be, uh, um, be seeing you on Wednesday, if, if not before. <laughs>